This is Dr. Gear, and this is Unit 5, Chapter 8 Lecture uh, on the subject of compensation. And I would say that this is going to be a relatively limited uh, lecture in the sense that most of the items around compensation, uh, as Rebor uh, dealt with them in his book, dealt uh, more from a central office or district office perspective rather than from a principal's perspective, which obviously is uh, our focus mostly in this course. However, I will elaborate on certain points. As a principal, one item in terms of compensation that I would uh, use as an overarching framework uh, for your thinking around compensation is that uh, there is a great deal of value placed by individuals on items that we wouldn't normally consider compensation. For instance, what is the culture environment of the building? If that's good, some people will uh, view that as uh, something of great value and in a sense is a, is a form of compensation. I'm now going on to the uh, next page, which is variables affecting compensation. Um, I'd like to elaborate a bit on pay for performance. Uh, that has been an experiment which has been uh, tried in, in several school districts and generally it has been unsuccessful in its implementation in the school setting. And uh, the reasons for that really come from, a diff from about three different uh, places. The first one is uh, how do you measure uh, the metrics which will uh, kick in pay for performance. In other words, uh, is it going to be just test scores? Is it going to be some other kind of index? Is it qualitative? Is it quantitative in nature? So this whole measurement piece is problematic. Uh, as states go towards a more value added assessment uh, scheme where uh, we measure students from the place they are when they come to the teacher in September to the place where they exit uh, at the end of the school year with the theory being that uh, a, a, a good teacher will bring that student through one year of growth or more, that has some potential for uh, measurement for uh, the purposes of pay for performance. The next reason pay for performance has had its problems is the whole question of who decides who gets the uh, pay and who doesn't. Oftentimes this has been the function of some committee. Um, there is hesitancy to place a lot of this power uh, that is associated with pay for performance in the hands of uh, just administrators in the sense that people fear that you know, the favorite son or daughter will uh, get compensation whereas others won't. Also one of the issues around this is, is the Lake Wobegon effect everybody's above average, everybody gets paid for performance. The last issue around pay for performance is it has been shown to lead to falsification of testing when that was used as the metric to decide whether someone got a, a raise or not that uh, principals and teachers have actually altered test scores in order to qualify for these bonuses. The other uh, issue that uh, I'd like to just quickly point out is the whole idea around seniority and just to uh, have you think about the idea that uh, you are rewarded uh, for longevity and not performance and the issues that that brings to the table. I'm going on to the next page, we're on page three. Different types of compensation. Well, I, I began uh, this lecture with some discussion around a term that economists call psychic income, and that is that people derive value from non-monetary items, such as the culture of the school, the family atmosphere it may convey, um, even how close one is to home in terms of commute. All can be valued and can be considered a form of uh, indirect compensation. One of the things that uh, I would challenge you as a principal is, is that you will not have a lot of uh, discretion over uh, being able to compensate people monetarily generally. 
So you have to become creative and figure different ways to compensate uh, outstanding performance, such as recognitions uh, at faculty meetings, things like uh, nominations for awards. And, and believe it or not, people place great value on this. And I have seen this in both the Horry County and the Marion districts, uh, or uh, the Georgetown district, where they have the Teacher of the Year uh, contest. And there's, uh, or Teacher of the Year award contest isn't really a good word for it, but there's a lot of um, prestige that goes with this particular award. And as a result of that, uh, people feel, uh, in a sense, compensated for their good work, even through the nomination process. Take a look at things like, uh, oftentimes, television stations will have, you know, awards for outstanding teachers, um, professional organizations, and so on. Another way to reward um, uh, employees is uh, is actual career ladders that have been built. By that is, is uh, you know, a teacher takes on more uh, leadership roles as a department chair, maybe chairs of committee, other forms of teacher leadership. One of the overarching ideas that I would push at you when it comes to compensation and to consistently keep this in mind is that it's very important that we as administrators do not mess with people's paychecks. I will say that again. You have to be very careful with people's paychecks in the sense that oftentimes uh, any mistake on them, any type of uh, underpayment or, or some type of, uh, of problem will result in an undermining of your uh, your pers well the employee's perspective of your competence so as such make sure that um, when you are a building principal that items that are being submitted for pay albeit extra duties mileage whatever it is is done in an effective way um, one of the things that uh, Reboard talks about and I wanted to emphasize is salary is motivation in my 30 years in, in the field, um, it doesn't matter how much you pay someone, it is never enough. And that's just human nature. Um, what really drives performance is intrinsic motivation of the person wanting to do a good job, the work ethic and pride that he or she takes in the work that they do each day. So don't get me wrong, salary certainly helps. But uh, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that there's a lot of research around this and salary is not one of the major uh, motivators in terms of the quality of someone's uh, job performance. Rebor also discusses community wage data and I just wanted to speak to that a little more specifically in the sense that this is important uh, not so much from the principal's point of view directly, but however, uh, it does greatly influence the community's perspective on the district as a whole and consequently uh, a school building, its staff, the principal, in the sense that the uh, compensation that the educators in a community get needs to be somewhat in line with the rest of the community. If the community views educators as overpaid, it undermines support for education and uh, can, can create long-term problems. On to the next page. Uh, this is about salary schedule. One of the things that I would point out to you that, uh, is that since uh, South Carolina is not a collective bargaining state in terms of teacher unions, this is not necessarily uh, an issue, but if any of you ever go into uh, another state where there is collective bargaining, what happens with salary schedules is over time, uh, as new contracts are negotiated, uh, money may be pushed at the low end or the high end or the middle of a salary schedule. And over time, what happens is uh, it gets skewed in various steps. For example, um, let's say that we were, um, that, uh, that the uh, salary was pushed at the high, higher end, more experienced uh, educators on the salary schedule. Well, 
with the most experience, you could get huge jumps between, say, year 15 and year 16, where the percentage gain there may be 16%, whereas somebody who's in year 2 to year 3 may get as small as maybe a 5% increase from step to step. So uh, the reason that I bring this up is occasionally uh, if you uh, become an HR person and there are salary schedules in your district, you need to take a look at those and make sure that uh, over time various steps have not gotten out of, uh, out of whack compared to others. One of the things also I would suggest is that as HR folks, we want to extend the salary schedule as long as we can. So in other words, lots of steps so that a teacher goes from step to step to step so that they don't get to the top end of your pay scale quickly. One of the things I would mention is, is for you to pay attention to your base salary and uh, as an HR professional, are you competitive with your neighbors? You need to be uh, able to attract quality candidates to your school district. So your base salary needs to uh, reflect that. Now going on to page six, payroll considerations. Overall, payroll can become a very complex uh, operation based on uh, all of the things that go into it beyond uh, just uh, a salary. You may have payroll deductions that Rebor lists in this, uh, in this uh, PowerPoint. And uh, I would say to you that the more deductions there are for various items, the more there's a likelihood for error. So one of the things as a payroll department, if you ever are part of that, you have to be very, very aware of that and as well making sure that accuracy of the uh, information coming from the sites is such that it, 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 it's feeding the system in an accurate manner. One of the things that uh, you do have some discretion over in terms of uh, pay periods is that you want to stretch those out. In other words, you don't want uh, every week pay periods, one, because of the short turnover it, uh, time to get the, uh, the payroll uh, produced, but also you want to be sitting on those chunks of money that will go into payroll as long as you possibly can to accrue the interest uh, into your general fund. I'm moving on to uh, page seven of the PowerPoint. Uh, a couple of things that I would suggest around compensation and recommendations to the board if you ever get to that level is try to be somewhere in the middle of the pack in terms of the way that your compensation packages look as uh, compared and contrasted with your neighbors. And uh, the other thing that I would say is, is that you have to become something of an amateur economist in this whole uh, realm of a payroll and consequently uh, the budgeting procedures because you have to keep an eye on the pulse of the economy. Is inflation breaking out? What, what are the costs uh, going to happen? For instance, one of the things uh, as a school leader, uh, it, I'm sure that uh, you know some some superintendents are thinking about right now is how will the Gulf oil spill affect their district in the long term? Will the price of fuel oil go up? Um, will there be some form of, of taxation that occurs to help the cleanup? Those are the types of things that you keep an eye on to try and uh, understand where you think that long-term health of the economy is going. And um, that is quite a challenge, believe me. We're headed on to the eighth, uh, the eighth uh, slide on indirect compensation. One of the things that I did want to elaborate on here is there are some things in voluntary fringe benefits that I wanted to uh, emphasize. For instance, uh, the 403B plans, which are a form of tax sheltered annuity where uh, employees can get um, some of their gross pay taken out to be put into investments and this lowers their pay, gross pay for uh, taxation purposes and contributes to their uh, retirement funding. 
So uh, that's something that uh, districts offer. There's been quite a few changes around the law, and now there are third-party administrator, administrative companies that deal with this. Um, and if you are not using the 403B, I would suggest that you take a look and see if your district offers the option and if you, and uh, begin one. There's uh, insurance companies, you've, you've all seen the Aflac commercials on television. This type of insurance is something that the, an employer can offer uh, his or her employees w without incurring any costs. The only, um, the only uh, thing that the employer does in this is to uh, provide payroll deductions uh, to fund the insurance for things like disability, uh, accidents, uh, long-term care and um, it's a low-cost uh, benefit for a district to offer to its employees. Um, you, you may have flex spending accounts, uh, you know, putting aside X number of dollars every year so that you can pay uh, for health care or child care. Um, and again, this lowers your gross income, so uh, you're, you're not being taxed uh, on the higher levels of gross income when it comes to paying your federal income tax. Um, one of the newer items deals with health savings accounts and I'm going to talk about that on the next page which is on health care and related insurance. So I'm on, uh, on page 9 now. Health insurance historically was a very cheap benefit for school districts and it was used to attract staff. Obviously, as you are most likely aware of, this has changed significantly. For instance, for, uh, for the school district where I was just superintendent, uh, a family plan for uh, a family uh, medical insurance was somewhere in the neighborhood of between ten to $12,000 per year. So depending on the contribution level of the employee, you can see this is a significant uh, cost to a district to provide this benefit and the scary thing around health insurance is, is that generally it's been increasing anywhere from 8 to 20 percent per year so it is a significant cost to school districts and in collective bargaining and negotiations this is one of the places where districts have been really really bargaining hard is to increase the employee contribution rate uh, to pay for health insurance. One of the schemes that has been brought forward, and, and this is a win-win in the health care situation, is the use of health savings accounts. How this works is, is that the basic premise is, is that uh, some people will opt for lower cost plans. For instance, young people oftentimes single or without a family, they don't use health insurance a whole lot uh, compared with other age groups, uh, people with uh, young children, um, um, some of us who are a little grayer than you, we use our health insurance more than, than uh, young people. So uh, what districts do is they offer a lower cost plan to these this group of employees and um, compared with the high cost plan there is a savings and what uh, districts have done to sweeten this uh, proposition is they'll set up a health savings account uh, kick in some of that savings and then pocket some of the savings uh, for the district itself it's kind of a win-win because what happens is is contrary to like your flex spending account the health savings account can accrue over time and you can take this right into retirement. So if you contributed to a health savings plan um, account over time, you could have a, a large chunk of money by the time you go to retire that you can use to offset medical costs, buy medical insurance, and so on. On a final note, uh, I would say that health insurers love educators. They like them for two reasons. One is we engage in less risky behaviors than the general population and have a tendency to take care of our health better than the general population. As a result, the health insurance costs of educators as a group are lower than the general population. 
this can have some advantages. One is if you are a big enough district, you could consider self-funding your health insurance. So in other words, you get an administrative, you either set up an administrative wing of a district office to administer your own health insurance, or you can even bring in a third party administrator uh, to do that. Um, the other thing that this opens up is the idea of health care consortiums where different school districts may bond together so there's, there's a big pool of uh, potential uh, employees to fund the health insurance and um, which try to do is to get health insurance providers to compete for your business through that consortium of several districts. With that, that is uh, uh, the items that I wanted to point out from Unit 5, Chapter 8, and I'll talk to you again soon.